Hello, and welcome to this edition of Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine. Today our episode deals with orthopedics, and helping us discuss that topic is Dr. David Mikulajczyk from Lakeshore Orthopedics. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mikulajczyk. Thanks for having me. Uh, just to get off started, your specialty is carpal tunnel with the hand in the wrist, correct? Correct. Okay, wonderful. Uh, how long have you been in the field of orthopedics? Well, I've been practicing for just over five years now. I uh, came straight out of training uh, and went to Manitowoc uh, Lakeshore Orthopedics, and we also have an office here in Sheboygan. Uh, so I've been practicing just over five years. Okay. With that, I'm sure you had some education that you had to go through first as far as that goes. Could you expand on the types of education that you've gone through? Yeah. I grew up here in Plymouth, uh, so Sheboygan County native. Uh, I went to undergrad at University of Notre Dame. And then I did my medical school at Loyola uh, in Chicago. I stayed there for orthopedic residency, which is five more years. And then I did an extra year of uh, hand surgery fellowship in Cincinnati. Nice. So when you went into orthopedics, or when it's more generally a surgeon, you know, is, is there additional education that you have to go through versus, you know, you go through being doctor school, obviously, then you've got mm -hmm. all these other things to add on? Yeah, med school is four years, and then you pick what you want to go into. And if you pick a surgical field, whether it's general surgery or orthopedics or uh, a variety of other ones, uh, those are usually longer residencies. So mm -hmm. orthopedics is five years, um, whereas you know family practice and some of the other ones are as little as three years. Mm -hmm. So there's a varying uh, length of residency. That's the major difference. And then. During residency, you know, I choose to do hand and uh, wrist fellowship, so that's an extra year of training. So within orthopedics, you can choose spine, foot and ankle, uh, tumor, trauma, sports medicine, you know, hand and wrist. There's a lot of variety that you can choose to subspecialize, uh, so I went into the hand and wrist. Okay. And that brings me to my next question. With orthopedics, what part of the body does it all affect and, you know, what is usually affected when it comes to that? So orthopedics is the bones, um, and it's pretty much all the bones uh, except the head. Uh, so there's different specialties, you know, you know, whether it's the hand up to the elbow for hand and wrist, there's shoulder elbow surgeons, there's sports doctors who do knees and shoulders, uh, joint replacements do hip, uh, joint replacement surgeons do hip and knee replacements, foot and ankle surgeons. So it pretty much covers all the bones um, except the head. That's okay. up to the neurosurgeons. Sure. Now, as a surgeon, do you have to recertify every so often? Yeah, you have to pass your initial boards. But there's a set of written boards, and then there's oral boards for orthopedics. And then every 10 years, you have to recertify. Okay. Um, getting into your specialty, carpal tunnel, the hand and the wrist, what is carpal tunnel? So carpal tunnel is a pinched nerve at the wrist. Uh, the median nerve is, is tight, basically, and it develops for a lot of various reasons, uh, some of which we don't most of the time we don't know why it develops um, and it leads to numbness and tingling in the fingers and pain uh, and people have symptoms at night and driving you know using instruments stuff like that so it's very common uh, very common problem now is carpal tunnel the same thing as carpal tunnel syndrome yes okay just wanted to clarify that for our viewers when you hear it yeah as i know is this a fairly new thing or has this been around for quite a it's while it's been around tunnel? forever yeah it's been around forever um you know, a lot of people think it's related to activity, whether it's job related uh, or using a computer. Uh, some studies have shown some jobs are, you know, can be related with carpal tunnel, but a lot of times we don't know a specific cause. And it happens to people that don't do those jobs too. So, uh, but yeah, it's been around for a long time. It's, you know, not new, uh, but it's very common. So a lot of people know a little bit about it. Okay. Where, you know, on the wrist and arm would I mostly feel pain? For carpal tunnel. So usually it's uh, the nerve is tight here, um, so you'll feel pain mm -hmm. that shoots up the arm on this side and up into the fingers. And usually these three fingers, sometimes part of the ring finger, the small finger, uh, a different nerve goes to the small finger, so it's usually not involved. Okay. What are the different ways that you can treat carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, we often uh, start with non-operative treatment, splints that you wear at night to keep your wrist straight. If you're sleeping and your wrist is moving back and forth, uh, that can put pressure on the nerves, so the splints try and help that. Uh, occasionally, we'll do therapy or cortisone injection to try and calm down the symptoms. Um, and then if nothing works and the symptoms are persistent, then we talk about surgery. Surgery, okay. Um, will carpal tunnel go away by itself? It can, yeah, if people have a mild form. Um, uh, it's also very common with pregnancy. That goes away after, uh, typically after they deliver the baby. Um, 
most of the time, however, it, it is calm at first and then gets more severe over time and more consistent. Uh, so a lot of the time it doesn't go away, but sometimes it does. Okay. How many surgeries would you say you do on average in a year's time? In a year? Um, between five and 600. Wow. Yeah. Is it a real invasive type surgery or is it a pretty quick outpatient type? It's very quick. Yeah, the incision is small. It's only a couple centimeters in length. Um, people get a little sedation. In my hands, they get a little sedation and then I uh, numb up the area. Uh, it only takes a few minutes for me to do a carpal tunnel. They wake up, they have a soft dressing, and they're out the door pretty quickly. Okay. What if someone would just, for whatever reason, let their carpal tunnel go? They don't want to get it treated. They're afraid. You know, what can happen? Well, the, the problems can become permanent. If it's severe carpal tunnel and it's been there for years, uh, you can get atrophy of the muscles, uh, some of the muscles in the hand, and that will not get better even after a surgery. Uh, and the numbness and tingling can be uh, permanent too. Okay. Is there anything that one can do to prevent getting carpal tunnel? Not really. No? Not really. Because most of the time we don't know what causes it, so it's hard to prevent it. You know, usually when you notice the symptoms, it's good to get in to be seen right away and start treatment with splints to try and you know, get it to calm down on its own uh, before we start talking about more invasive treatment. But as far as prevention, uh, not necessarily. So, on all the topics I've had on the show, for once it's not due to weight or <laughs> my diet or anything like that. <laughs> not necessarily. It can be related to, to diabetes, which is, you know, can yep. be related to diet and taking care of yourself. Um, so there are some associations with that, um, but usually it's uh, what we call idiopathic, doesn't really have a specific cause. Okay. What about age? Is that a factor? Uh, yes, I mean, we don't see it in teenagers uh, or 20 year olds, uh, but once you start getting to 30, you know, 40 year olds, we see it from them all the way, you know, through the rest of life. So uh, it's a little more common in the 40, 50 year old population, um, but we do see it throughout the range of adulthood. Um, okay. So with, with orthopedics, the, is the specialty of obviously you said the bones and all of that. So you actually, when you go in, if you have to, is it a matter of just freeing up enough space so the nerve isn't pinched or do you actually have to move the nerve or do anything like that? It's giving the nerve more space. So there's a really tight ligament over the top of the nerve. So that's what we divide. And once you divide it, then the space opens up and the nerve can breathe and heal itself. Uh, so for this particular problem, we don't have to touch the nerve or move the nerve or anything like that, just giving it space. How long does a procedure like that usually take? Uh, it takes me five minutes. Five minutes and it's all done. Yeah. Probably more for the prep work and recovery yeah. than there is for the <laughs> yeah, right. so procedure. Right. Wow. Um, flipping the arm over a little bit, I know mm -hmm. another thing is tendonitis. Mm -hmm. And I know one thing I've got is a problem right in here just below the elbow. Yeah. As far as that goes where it's probably just as painful as carpal tunnel. Right. And there too, what causes that? That's more overuse, uh, repetitive use. Uh, it's typically lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Uh, they're the same thing. Uh, and that's, I see a lot in my workers' population, people doing repetitive work on the lines in the factories, um, a lot of you know, twisting and manipulating parts. Uh, and that just causes inflammation uh, and pain where, that, where the tendon that extends your wrist attaches to the elbow. So that's where the cause of the problem is. Okay. Um. There again, too, what are some of the ways that that can be treated? That's usually treated non-operatively. Uh, there's a surgery for it, but it's pretty rare. Um, so it's usually treated with therapy, <coughs> Excuse uh, me. cortisone injections, uh, anti-inflammatories, trying to avoid the activities that aggravate it. And usually it gets better with time, but it can take months for it to calm down. I know there's been a few times where I've been treated, you know, for physical therapy, where I have to do my exercises with the weights and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, with exercises and physical therapy, why doesn't it aggravate it, or how does it help versus aggravating it more? Well, the exercises should be stretching out that muscle, you know, to try and get it to calm down. Um, you don't want to do activity that aggravates it. Um, so once it calms down, then you have to build up the strength. So some of the strength thing comes into play. Uh, but therapy, a lot of therapy is ultrasound treatments mm -hmm. and, and different stuff like that to calm down the inflammation first uh, before building up the strength. Sure. So. Like I said, with that, again, are there some things that I can do either in general practices or everyday routines or exercises to help prevent? 
Yeah, there are stretching exercises that you can do uh, to stretch out those muscles uh, on your own, um, but it's really more uh, avoiding the activities that aggravate it. Mm -hmm. You know, that repetitive you know, twisting, turning, it's usually worse when your arm is straight, when your elbow's bent, it's a little better. Um, so that usually helps more, is just avoiding those activities that, that aggravate it. Okay. Throughout the years, have either condition changed or has it been pretty much the same throughout the years? Or has our activities changed, you know, moving more into the computer realm and, you know, little games and phones and all of that? Have you seen an increase or has, you know, the changed? There's not much studies on that yet as far as texting and phones and carpal tunnel. Uh, it's still a relatively new phenomenon, but uh, it hasn't really been borne out to, to cause more carpal tunnel. Um, you know, more people are... Uh, active older because people are healthier now so we see just more older people doing more activities so that can cause both the carpal tunnel and the uh, tennis elbow um, but otherwise it's been they're both pretty consistent over the years as uh, how often they occur. How have the treatments changed over the years through technology or just new procedures? Well, we have a lot less minimally invasive stuff. Yeah, the incisions for carpal tunnel release now are much smaller. Uh, some people do them through uh, a scope, which is a smaller incision. Um, uh, so there's less recovery after surgery, just uh, less healing, less dissection. You know, the incisions used to be really large mm -hmm. on the hand. Now they're very small. Uh, so that's probably the biggest change. Um, and then, you know, for, for tennis elbow, it's more of the therapy modalities and ultrasound treatments and uh, they make minimally invasive stuff that you can do for that, you know, through the ultrasound mm -hmm. machine to treat it too. So that's, uh, technology has helped for both. Cortisone shots, do they help for carpal tunnel as well, or is that pretty much just tennis elbow that where that's good for? They can help with carpal tunnel, but it's usually temporary. It's usually not a permanent or long-term solution. Uh, some people do get months of relief uh, from it. Uh, I typically use it in carpal tunnel. Uh, if somebody has an EMG test, which is a nerve test, mm -hmm. um, that comes back and it's not quite, you know, it's borderline, a uh, cortisone shock can be diagnostic. If the patient gets better with cortisone, it's a good sign that they'll get better with surgery. Sure. Um, but it, it can help, but it's usually temporary. Okay. Um, could you explain how a cortisone shot really works and where it actually gets administrated to? So cortisone is an anti-inflammatory, uh, so it works on a molecular level to try and decrease those inflammatory cells in the area. Um, and so most of the time we're injecting it right into the area that hurts the most. You know, so for tennis elbow, you push on the elbow and if it hurts, that's where you inject it to try and get it to calm down. So it's like taking, you know, an anti-inflammatory pill, but it goes right to the mm -hmm. source. It doesn't go up through your bloodstream. So does it, is it injected directly into the muscle or the nerve, or is it actually into the bone or by the bone? Uh, it's, it's into the tendon, which is right by the bone, okay. you know, so the tendon attaches to the muscle. It's, the tendon is where the muscle attaches to the bone, and that's the problem for tennis elbow. So that's right where you put the injection. So it's right by the bone. You can't inject into the bone, but sometimes it feels like it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes they're a little uncomfortable, but that's where you put it. Yeah. As I know, I've had a couple of shots of cortisone in the elbows, but also in the shoulder when mm -hmm. I had, you know, finally I had shoulder surgery or rotator cuff, but when yeah. I went to, the, went to the doctor, you know, he says, oh, I'll give you a shot of cortisone. And he came out with a needle that looked about <laughs> this long. And then when he says, coming through the back, and I just said to him, and I looked down, I says, if that thing comes out my front of my side of my shoulder, <laughs> we're going to have a problem here, I think. So <laughs> it was kind of intimidating a little bit. Uh, yeah. Just like with a dentist, you know, they come with a needle that long and it disappears and you don't know where, it go where it's going. Uh, yeah, needles sometimes uh, really scare patients. Usually mine are very small because uh, I don't have to go that deep uh, in the hand. Uh, but yeah, they can be a little intimidating. Yeah. What are some of the risk factors? Uh, risk factors, uh, diabetes, like you mentioned, if mm -hmm. people have thyroid problems, that can uh, lead to uh, carpal tunnel. Um, uh, those are the two biggest uh, risk factors. Uh, for, for tennis elbow, it's, it's more of the activity. It's, it's activity related and what you're doing with your arm that causes it. Okay. Let's say if I have a surgery or I go ahead, yes, I'm going to have a surgery or whatever treatments, whatever. Are there any risk factors associated with each of those? Uh, for having for needing surgery right not necessarily it's just if it doesn't get better with the other stuff you know if we try the splinting therapy cortisone all that stuff and it doesn't get better um, then surgery is an option for for both problems um, it's much more common to do carpal tunnel release than mm -hmm. than to do surgery for the tennis elbow sure um, 
it's a more common problem, and then the tennis elbow usually responds better to conservative treatment. Okay, nice. Um, if I wanted to, let's say, I've got this problem. When should I go see an orthopedic versus maybe just go see a regular doctor? You know, if I feel, you know, this doesn't feel right or it's starting to hurt more and more. Yeah, it's personal <clears throat> personal choice. A lot of people have good relationships with their family, family physician, um, and I get a lot of referrals from the family physician uh, when it gets to the point where splints aren't helping or they've gotten an EMG mm -hmm. uh, and it shows that it's pretty bad. That's usually when I get the referral. Uh, but you could start by just calling, you know, the office and making an appointment uh, straight away. Sometimes your insurance companies require a, mm -hmm. a referral, referral, so um, you have to look at that too. Yep. Can only orthopedic surgeons or somebody who's certified in orthopedics give cortisone shots, or can any general physician? Any general physician can. Um, a lot of times in the hand, I feel like uh, a lot of the family practice doctors aren't as comfortable uh, maybe as they used to be just with all the anatomy and the arteries nerves stuff like that um, so I don't see a lot of people already have having had a cortisone shot for for carpal tunnel mm -hmm. or in the hand uh, but a lot of them have for the elbow um, but anybody can any physician can okay I'm gonna kind of throw your curveball here a little bit uh, chiropractors mm-hmm is there any treatments that possibly, you know, they're manipulating the bones and the structures and everything. Is there any treatments that possibly a chiropractor could do which may help relieve some of the pains? I, I think there are. I don't know too much about chiropractics myself uh, just because it's a different field. It's a different field, um, right. Uh, but, yes, I always, you know, if patients want it, I encourage it. Um, basically, whatever helps them feel better. Uh, certainly with tennis elbow, it's very similar to therapy, you know, different things they can do with the exercises around the elbow to help that uh, tendon calm down. Uh, with carpal tunnel, uh, there are some things with, you know, tendon gliding and stuff, again, very mm -hmm. similar to therapy. Uh, but I don't know too much about specific chiro chiropractic. Um, there's not much they can do to give the nerve more room. Yeah. Really, that's a surgical S issue at a that physical. point because uh, it's just a physical barrier. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I tell patients, certainly you can try it. If it helps, that's great. Okay. With tennis elbow and even with carpal tunnel, I'll ask, you know, there's some ointments you can get like, let's say, Icy Hot, Bengay, those deep heat mm -hmm. type treatments. Do they do any good? They can help with some of the symptoms. Um, the Bengay type of stuff is really a, a kind of a pain masking thing. It doesn't treat the inflammation. They do make some topical anti-inflammatories that are gels that you can put on there that, that will actually treat it a little better. Uh, and sometimes we use that. Some patients have problems taking anti-inflammatory pills because it's they, their stomach gets upset. And so sometimes we'll try topicals uh, for that. Okay. So the good old thing of just take some ibuprofen and call me in the morning really doesn't apply all the time. It doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can, you can start with that. You can try it, certainly. Uh, and if it works, fine. Um, but a lot of people get to the point where that just isn't helping. And right. that's usually when they show up in my office. Yeah. And that's when they should call instead of, well, I'll just take three ibuprofen, four right. ibuprofen. More isn't always better. No. No, you're just going to have problems with your stomach. stomach then, yeah. yeah. Then you wind up with an ulcer and then you can go to a different specialist <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, can you tell us about some of the tests that you do? You know, like you mentioned some of the new modalities that, you know, that have come up. Can you give us some explanations on those? Well, the big test for a carpal tunnel is uh, called an EMG or nerve conduction velocity test. Um, usually a, a neurologist or a physiatrist does it, and that's where they test the nerves going down the arm. And if a nerve is pinched, you can measure that. Um, and so it gives you numbers to help quantify how bad the carpal tunnel may be. Um, so that's the big test for carpal tunnel. Um, the diagnosis is usually made on a history and physical exam, uh, but the EMG can help augment that. Uh, for um, tennis elbow, uh, we, I do get x-rays on everybody to make sure there's no arthritis in the joint or a bony problem underneath that's causing it. Um, uh, MRIs are usually not necessary uh, to make the diagnosis, um, so usually that's more physical exam. How about ultrasounds? Do you use any of that? Yeah, my partners do. Uh, we have a sports medicine um, a family practice doctor who uses ultrasound to look at the tendon, and she also does a minimally invasive procedure. Uh, and so a lot of times I'll do that for tennis elbow uh, before doing surgery is I'll refer patients to her just because it's a little easier recovery than an open surgery. You just bring up a good point or a question that I want to bring up is, you know, you mentioned sports medicine versus everyday work, you know, versus computer work or whatever. You know, I mean, they're all seen 
kind of being more specialized these days. Mm -hmm. You know, where, how do I know where I would go to? You know, if I come to you, and let's say if it's a sports related, something I did or whatever, would you treat it or would, you know, you get your partner involved or how does that all work? There's some overlap. Usually, you know, I cover everything from the fingertip to the elbow. Um, mm -hmm. The elbow is kind of one of those overlap areas. A lot of sports medicine doctors will see uh, tennis elbow and some of the more repetitive use type of injuries about the elbow. Um, once you get down into the hand and wrist, uh, you don't see a lot of sports medicine doctors taking care of that stuff. It just gets a little too intricate and sure. it's pretty specialized at that level. Plus just about anything can happen. You know, I mean, I could fall over backwards in this sports thing and, you know, or whatever. So Right, yeah, yeah. The injury, you know, whether it's a fracture or something like that, the injury doesn't necessarily care whether you did it during sports or at work or on the ice or mm -hmm. whatever. So usually the hand and wrist stuff usually comes to me. Uh, the sports medicine doctors don't see that type of stuff. Okay. What's the average recovery time? You know, if I say I've been, I got carpal tunnel real bad and we do the surgery, when can I start feeling the relief and where I'm actually back to normal? So the first thing that gets better is symptoms at night. It's very common for people to have problems at night and they gotta wake up and they shake their hand out. Most patients say that gets better the, the day of surgery. Uh, and then the numbness tingling varies as to when it gets better. Sometimes it's a couple days, sometimes it's weeks, depending on the severity before surgery. So I see patients back two weeks after surgery. A lot of them are doing much better. Some mm -hmm. of them are completely better uh, and some of them just need more time. So it's anywhere from two weeks to, you know, sometimes six weeks, and the real bad ones can take a while. Okay. Have you ever had an instance where you had to go back in and make more room, or is there ever a chance that it can, you know, the bones or whatever you do, it'll grow shut and actually pinch it again? It's very rare to have to go back. Usually a carpal tunnel release is a permanent fix. Um, sometimes I see people that have had carpal tunnel, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and they did well with it, and then it comes back for whatever reason. Usually when you release that ligament over the nerve, you'll get scar tissue that forms, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's usually at a, a bigger volume, so the nerve has space. Uh, occasionally people can get it back, but it's pretty rare. Any chance of like, you know, something like arthritis, or does that play into a factor at all? Well, arthritis, the, the wrist joint is just underneath where the nerve goes through, mm -hmm. uh, so if you have swelling uh, of the soft tissues from arthritis, that can put pressure on the nerve mm -hmm. and cause it. Uh, usually they're two separate problems, uh, but they can be related. Okay. Well, turning a little bit to, you know, the types of surgeries and whatever. Like years ago, like you said, they'd lay you wide open just about. Mm -hmm. And now they have, you know, procedures like arthroscopic and is there endoscopic? Yep. Could you go into those two a little bit as far as what they all entail? Yeah, so arthroscopic means you're going into a joint with a scope through small incisions. Um, and I do wrist scopes for a variety of different you know, problems, ligament tears, stuff like that. Uh, endoscopic, uh, like there's endoscopic carpal tunnel, mm -hmm. that means you're doing it through a scope, but it's not necessarily in a joint. Um, so again, smaller incision, um, and the goal is to try and get people to recover faster just because mm -hmm. it's less surgery. Now, you know, they say a scope. What is actually a scope and what is it doing? So it's a camera. Um, and so it's got a little metal sheath with a small camera on the end, and you can put it in small spaces to, to look at things. Um, and it's minimally invasive, so it helps. You don't have to make big incisions. Uh, and then you make other small incisions to put instruments in. So if okay. I'm doing a wrist scope, you put the camera in one hole, and you put instruments in other holes to okay. try and manipulate things and, and debride things and clean things up. Uh, so it's much easier than making a big incision, sure. having a lot of scar tissue, stuff like that. Okay, because I always wondered, I always thought, you know, the, the instruments and everything were right on the scope. When you say, well, we'll go in and scope it, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, well, I don't know, I can't understand how they do that all. So it's actually different instruments. Different instruments, and you got to have more than one hole to kind of okay. get both the scope and the instruments in there. Yeah. Okay. Do you see, this is kind of the future way out, but, you know, some technologies like, you know, 3D printing or the way other technologies come out, do you ever see that coming into a factor of, you know, helping with, you know, nowadays, I'm surprised they can't even just print a new wrist or a new, you know, <laughs> as far as that goes, any experimentation with that or anything that you're aware of? I think most of the stuff going to be coming out is with gene therapy and genetics, okay. um, making different injections with genetics that you can uh, inject to help with 
whether it's arthritis or carpal tunnel, I think that's probably where the future lies. Uh, they haven't quite figured out that yet, um, but that's probably what's coming is, is more of a genetic-based treatment for stuff. Okay. If I wanted to find out more about orthopedics, just reading up on it, general information, where are some good sources I could go to? Well, our website, uh, HFM Health uh, slash Lakeshore, Lakeshore Orthopedics, has um, different stuff on uh, both the hand and wrist surgery on my page and my partner's page have good patient information. Mm -hmm. uh, websites like WebMD are pretty reputable. They have good information. You have to be careful with the Internet and what's out there. It's yep. you know, filled with horror stories. So. Well, come on. If it's on the Internet, it's got to be true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you have to be a little careful. A lot of patients come in, you know, with a preconceived idea mm -hmm. of just because of what they've read on the internet. Um, but if you go to good websites, uh, you'll find a lot of good information. I just brought up another point that I wanted to ask you. Do you see, you know, with all these resources available at people, and they can go to wherever on the internet, do you see people tend to self-diagnose themselves? Oh, yeah. And then self-treat? Yeah, exactly. A lot of people have come in trying this and that and, you know, they, they've read it on the internet or they've known somebody that's tried it mm -hmm. and um, sometimes it works and most of the time it doesn't because they're in my office. So well, Obviously it doesn't work and then the risk factors go up because they try to do something themselves. But Potentially. Yeah, you haven't potentially. had anybody do surgery on themselves yet, have you? No. Okay, That's a good thing. Yeah. Don't do surgery on your... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, Excellent. Um, before we wrap, is there any final thoughts you have on what we talked about today or any advice or just f final thoughts? No, I think, you know, especially with the carpal tunnel and the tennis elbow, they're both very common problems. Um, if you're having a problem, you know, I'd be happy to see you in my office. Um, they're very treatable. Uh, they do get better. Uh, you don't have to suffer. Mm -hmm. A lot of patients, after they've been treated, wish they had done it sooner. Sure. Um, so you don't have to wait too long. Just get in, get treated, and, and you'll get better. Okay. Do you have an office number if somebody wanted to contact, you know, your office for additional information? Yeah, our Sheboygan office number is 452-6124. Uh, and in Manitowoc, it's 920-320-5241. And your website again is? Uh, it's hfmhealth uh, slash Lakeshore Orthopedics. Sure. Is that dot org, I'm assuming? That's dot org. Dot yeah. org, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. McLeisick, I'd like to thank you for having you on the show. I mean, this was very informational to me as far as that goes. So, I appreciate it. Thanks for having okay. me. Okay. Um, if our viewers at home would like to know any more information on this subject or have any ideas from our show, uh, you can contact us on our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. For quality of life, on behalf of Dr. McLeisick, uh, I'm Dave Augustine, your host. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.